Canto 10 of the Purgatory consolidates the tentative new beginnings, the new possibilities of this Eros, this other side of Eros that Dante has begun to sense through all the symbolism and dream and supernatural almost action of Canto 9. He's found a kind of golden thread and it's led him through the doorway across the threshold into purgatory proper. Um, it's a new vitality that he is going to at first sort of struggle to really see clearly, um, but then he's beginning going to begin to follow it. Um, I think you can think of um, this new beginning, you know, as a bit like um, the seed when it first pushes up from the ground. Um, you know, it may gonna may be that it's going to grow into a tremendous oak tree, but at first it's just a little leaf. Um, but there's something about um, the greenness of its vitality um, that makes you know that even though it's small, it's got tremendous potential. Um, I think, you know, this is a truth of the human psyche, that a life may have been very bad, um, it may have just been rather bland, but every so often, uh, maybe very frequently, but in small ways, across the course of even a single day, there are lots of little moments where a new possibility can be seen with the eyes that have the ability to see it, a new kind of eros, passion, desire in life. Um, and although it may seem very small compared to most of the desires, most of the forces which are shaping a life, um, maybe even seem like um, it must only cower before them uh, when a life is really pretty bad, nonetheless it has a kind of strength, it has a tenacity, um, it has a divine element, and that means that it's actually able to overturn everything in time. You know, a bit like um, the green shoot that can even destroy concrete um, given enough time. Um, that is the sense of love. I think Dante has sensed now, um, and um, this Canto 10 is going to begin to explore. And it's not that he's suddenly changed. I think what the dream with the eagle abducting him had shown him is that he's full of what in this canto um, is called by default bad love. Um, it's the love that wants to possess, that wants to steal, that has this violent desire, um, like the various abductions that he'd either experienced directly or um, alluded to in the previous canto. But he's also seen that there's a love that can carry, that wants to hold, that wants to grow into more. Um, this was the love um, that uh, carried um, him up to the, the gates of purgatory when Lucia carried him up. Um, as it were, he's begun to see that his dominant sense of love is not the only sense of love that there is, that there is actually another kind of love, a good love, um, that in fact it's going to turn out is way more powerful than the bad love that seems to so dominate his soul. But it's in seeing how it dominates through the dream most definitively, that he's able to see that actually there's more than just what he thought dominates the life of his psyche. There's another kind of Eros. And whilst at the moment he's mostly looking from within um, the possessive kind of Eros, the struggling Eros, um, the desire that turns in on itself, that's crooked, um, that doesn't find, doesn't seem to find a way to the divine because of that, um, he's also got a glimpse that there's more and he can see that even from within the darkness and um, that is what has carried him through the doorway. Um, he says in fact that the door slams resoundingly behind him um, and I think that's an indication that whilst it can seem like small beginnings, it can seem like something you half slept through as he slept through Lucia carrying him up. Nonetheless, there is something really definitive about this. Um, and, you know, this, this is a truth which you, you feel in psychotherapy, um, that someone may come to see you and wrestle with all sorts of troubles for a long time, um, feel um, jealousy, feel hatred, um, feel violence. Um, and yet every so often, um, 
a bit of compassion, a bit of love, um, a bit of desire for something else just shows itself. And the minute you've seen that, um, even if you don't then see it again for weeks or even months, you know that it's there in the psyche and given time it's going to win out, it's going to blossom and flourish. And I think that's what this door signals. Um, it's a kind of uh, the slamming of the door signals. Um, it's, it, it's, it's alluded to by a lot of spiritual adepts who will talk about things like there comes a moment when you choose righteousness and even if unrighteousness seems to still fill up a lot of your life, um, it's as if you've decided just to sort of forget that, turn your back on it, and to choose righteousness whenever you can. Um, that is the, the new eros, I think, that Dante um, is pointing to. I might say it's come to the moment where he must really find this new path, not keep analysing the darkness. Um, that has been necessary so that you can see the extent of it. But at the end of the day, what that sight does, that journey, that descent uh, through the inferno, what that does is actually show you the limits of the darkness as well and begin to opt for the light. Um, now this is um, shown quite literally actually um, in the beginning of Canto 10 um, because it says that when they came through the door and it shut resoundingly behind them. They squeezed through a kind of cleft, um, which is described as a needle's eye, it's described as the narrow path, these biblical allusions um, to um, this kind of bull's eye that once spotted you must aim for and find your way towards this bull's eye of good eros. Um, and then they find themselves on a path that's zigzagging and that Virgil says to Dante it's going to take all our wits, all our ability to keep on this zigzagging path. Um, now some of the commentators remark that this could literally be a path that's tilting um, to the left and the right and I quite like that idea because it's something about having glimpsed um, this new possibility um, and seeing beyond all the darkness inside him. Uh, it's going to take some time for this to settle down this new glimpse in Dante and he feels pushed around you know is it really true is it really there is the darkness not really greater what about all these things I'm still feeling that desire for possession to seize to control and um, to be possessed to be controlled you know by the swooping eagle um, and so it's a pretty rocky phase um, but it says that they go they do find a way along this zigzagging path and then they come to a new moment, um, a new experience, a new region of purgatory proper. And um, it's a flat space, um, it's up the side of the mountain, so although it's wide, um, it's not like an open plain because on one side of it is the drop um, off Mount Purgatory and then on the other side are the sheer cliffs of Mount Purgatory. Um, Dante says that it's about the width of three bodies lying end to end. Um, and it seems quite deserted, it seems quite plain. Um, it's got an emptiness to it, but also a kind of stillness, and the stillness I think of potential. Um, again, it's like coming out of that uh, struggle, that what's really going on in my life, have I really seen anything true at all, when you do for a moment latch on to something that feels true. Then they see something else, that on the mountain side of this wide path um, are incredibly beautiful images. Um, it's said that the, the, um, the wall is made of marble. Um, it's supernaturally bright and white and beautiful. And as they look, they see these images that are intensely beautiful. Um, they're so amazingly carved that they defeat any of the great Greek sculptors. Um, they seem actually alive. What they show are small moments of conversion in well-known figures' lives that, although small, made all the difference. It's when the eros inside a particular individual chose a different path, turned even momentarily towards the divine, and that changed everything for them. And it's so beautiful, these little moments, that even the remembrance of them 
in these amazing carvings seems full of life and that is clearly important because these moments are precisely the moments that give a new life that allow divine life to begin to take hold in a mortal's individuality in their psyche um, the good eros the good desire um, starts to really shape things henceforth three scenes are described in particular um, one is the moment that mary says yes to the angel um, you know this intensely private moment um, no one else was there um, but mary when the angel appears um, in the moment of fear um, says yes um, something uh, blooms literally inside her and um, the second moment is one um, from the Hebrew Bible it's the moment where King David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem um, and he starts to dance before the Ark of the Covenant um, and one of his wives Michal is looking on rather sneeringly um, but again it's a lovely sort of spontaneous moment that comes straight out of King David's soul um, and shows that he too um, is, in that moment at least, in line with the life um, of God and with the life that the Ark of the Covenant represents. Um, he's chosen to dance with it, um, at least momentarily, and it makes all the difference. And then the third incident um, is a legend from the life of the Emperor Trajan. Now again, we've got one of these arresting moments, the, the pagan emperor Trajan. There was a legend that went around that on the way to a great battle, so he's on his stallion, he's in his full regalia, surrounded by his troops, a widow stops him and asks for the emperor's blessing for a moment of justice. And at first Trajan doesn't even see the woman, um, then um, he turns to her and sort of shrugs her off, but she persists um, and eventually Trajan does turn and listen to her and grant her request. And again, you know, it's a very beautiful small moment amidst all the great drive of going to battle that in the legend shows that there was another kind of eros, another kind of passion in Trajan's heart. Um, and so it was thought um, that Trajan might well have found his way to heaven as a result. And it, that's what it speaks to Dante of here now. Um, you know, it, it's a bit like the biblical parable, say, of the mustard seed, the tiny thing, um, of um, the unjust judge who, in the Bible story, a widow bangs on his door all through the night and at first he says, go away until eventually he says, okay, I'll listen to you. Um, this is what conversion is like. This is what the discovery of this um, other eros is like. Um, it's not that suddenly everyone becomes good. It is that people glimpse it, hold fast to it, feel its life and steer towards it. Just as an aside, Virgil, of course, is there. Um, it says in one moment rather beautifully that Dante's standing on the side of Virgil's heart um, and Virgil does actually encourage Dante to look at these images um, which again I think is a sign of his change too. Um, he knows to pay attention to these moments. Remember he'd asked the angel to turn the locks in the door. Um, he is understanding something new and following that as well. And I think you might say that God loves these moments um, because they're part of his art, they're part of his creativity, uh, they're part of his love. And so when the soul responds to them, they're aligning themselves with the divine. Um, they have the quality of spontaneity, of freedom, um, of commitment, um, but of humility, which is mentioned a couple of times in this canto. Um, but, you know, I, I'm a bit wary of just saying, oh, they're being humble. Um, in this rather narrow, moral way. Um, the real significance of humility um, is that it's prepared to align with a force that isn't completely understood, um, but nonetheless is sensed to be of God. Um, and that is what Mary's yes, David's dance, and Trajan's finally getting around to listen to the widow. That is what that signals. Next, a crowd of souls are spotted by Virgil and Dante, um, and 
Interestingly, Dante the poet remarks that Dante the pilgrim freely turns to look at these new souls. Although he's seeing very beautiful things, he's not in the, in the images. Um, he's not trying to possess them. He's not stuck on them. He's actually free now um, with his desire to look at other new things as well. Um, that's another quality of this new kind of eros. In Blake's famous remark, it can kiss the joy as it flies and so live in eternity's sunrise, not bind to itself the joy and in the process kill it. Then Dante the poet gives us readers a warning about what we're going to see, because what we're going to see um, is really tough, very hard. Um, there's a new life here, but there's real struggle as well. And Dante the poet tells us, don't be put off by the effort that you're going to see now in purgatory, the genuine suffering that you're going to witness, because this suffering is accepted freely as all the individuals now have gained a glimpse of this new love, of this new life. They felt the eros stirring inside them, wanting more, not just to possess. And so they're prepared to undergo what seem like terrible punishments. They're prepared to bear their burdens in order to find a new way of steering through life. Um, you know, it, it raises this big question as to why salvation takes so long. Why is there a purgatory? What's the psychological truth of that? Um, and a first stab at that anyway, here now, um, is that, you know, we are tremendous beings, actually, and we're much more than just our conscious will, our conscious desire. But that extent of us can be possessed, can be stolen by the possessive, particularly Eros, um, all the other feelings that go along with that. Um, and so it takes time, even when the will has seen something new and decided to turn towards it, for that, if you like, to trickle out through the full extent of our being, um, you know, what would nowadays be called the unconscious parts as well. Um, even when people want to change, they can find themselves feeling tremendously stuck in their old ways. And the important thing in that moment is to hold on to the desire to change and to tolerate, to put up with what otherwise just seems to erupt, seems to be destroying um, the good intent. Um, it just takes time for it to percolate all the way through. Um, and there's a kind of love or compassion of the dark side of yourself that still exists, which is really important in this stage. And I think that is what Dante, the poet, is encouraging us to hold on to now. You know, the good side of the great extent of us is that in time it becomes more and more capable of enjoying the great extent of the divine life. Um, if we didn't have those many parts, if we weren't multitudes, um, as Walt Whitman put it, then we wouldn't be able to enjoy the multitudinous splendour of the divine. That is the goal that these first flickerings of new eros fix onto. What they see is at first quite hard to discern um, when they see these new souls approaching them. Both Virgil and Dante say, I can't quite make out what's going on. Um, but it turns out that these are souls who are carrying tremendous rocks, huge burdens that make them bend double, some almost completely flat on the ground, some standing up a little bit more, and they're beating their breasts. And of course, it's a very vivid image of a tremendous psychological truth um, that even after the moment of conversion, people can feel hugely um, burdened by their old life. We still carry these burdens around. We don't know how to put them down and frustration and anger and hatred and loathing um, at not being able to put them down, in fact, kind of makes them stick to us all the more. That's part of the torturous process. Um, you know, these are weights that aren't just the natural weight of gravity that would drag us down. These are weights which unwittingly we've taken on ourselves and so prevent the levity inside us from allowing us to stand upright and eventually fly. Um, that is what the souls on this first round, this first terrace, um, as it's normally called a purgatory, um, are wrestling with. Um, 
in the slightly clunky formula layout way, it's referred to as pride. This is the terrace of the proud. Um, and that's true, you know, as a sort of starter point. Um, but it's always really important to see into the life that these individuals are wrestling with so that we can feel what that really means inside us too. The image actually often speaks much, much more powerfully than um, the label. Um, to think about what it means to carry a burden around, not be able to put it down, but at the same time want to carry it around because you recognise it's part of you. It's going to be part of your richness if you can wrestle with it. Dante steps back a bit from the site and reflects on how we're like caterpillars, worms that are destined to turn into butterflies. I don't think he means that by some magical process of crystallization we automatically become like angels. Um, rather, he's saying something about this life, that on earth, if you can get this sense of what life's about, then you can wrestle with these things here and now. Um, these figures in purgatory hadn't been able to do that sufficiently enough. Um, and in a way, this is what life is for, you might say. Um, it's actually a great preparation for divine life. And it's a mistake, I think, to feel that in this earthly life, um, the fulfillment can be found. Um, you know, we are a bit like these figures who are in purgatory here and now with this mix of good love and bad love, with this mix of possessive eros and the eros that can give into the more. Um, and it's a mistake to think that somehow that more can be fully found upon earth. When that happens, um, life becomes burdensome because this earthly existence can't bear the full weight of heavenly reality, though it channels it, transmits it, symbolises it, gives us full glimpses of that future life. What Dante is intimating now towards the end of the canto um, is a completely new sense of what life on earth must be might be about. Um, it's not about trying to build heavens on earth and you know heaven knows 700 years later when with great technology and material power um, it feels like that is what we often try to do um, much to the detriment of the wider ecology and indeed to the suffering of souls. But this life in a way is to be led more modestly. It is, its real building site, you might say, um, its real place of change is in the human soul, um, is in relation to the world around us, um, is to convert, cultivating this different kind of eros. Um, you know, this isn't just about Dante's personal conversion, this is beginning to show up as a radically different vision of what earthly life is like, it's going to be quite like purgatorial life. But for now, the canto ends stressing the struggle of that. Um, you know, this is not an easy path to choose, which is perhaps why we often don't. Um, and the final image of the canto sees these souls beneath their great weights, as if, Dante says, they're saying that they can't possibly go on. And yet, somehow, because they have felt these first stirrings of the new expansive love, the new tremendous eros that at the end of the day can change everything. Somehow they do.